We should first point out that that award was given many years ago. And secondly, that the competition, Jason Everett, Chris Stefanik, please, I mean, <laughs> not hard. Um, let's say a quick prayer again. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed Mother, we entrust every man in this room to your care, your maternal care. Pray for us. Lead us to Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. There's going to be two parts to today's talk, and by parts, I mean parts. It's very annoying not having Google understand me when I do voice-to-text. People just see me saying things like, hey there, how are you doing? Hot dog. I don't, you know, it's very frustrating. So there will be two parts to today's talk. In the first part, I don't want to teach anything explicitly. What is that? In the, I, I want to ask a couple of questions, tell a story or two, to perhaps show us something that we may not know. In the second part of the talk, I want to suggest five rules that every man needs to break if he is to become the man he wants to be and who God is commanding him to be. I'd like to begin with a quote from C.S. Lewis. He said, when we consider the unblushing promises of reward from Christ in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink, sex, and ambition, while infinite joy is being offered to us. We are, he says, like a peasant child playing with mud pies in a slum, because we do not know what is meant by the offer to vacation at sea. I think too often we suspect, even subconsciously, that if you and I were to fully surrender our lives and every aspect of our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would somehow find ourselves unfulfilled, less alive than we might be, but this is, of course, false. It's the, the path of sin is what makes us dull and uninteresting. It's the saints who are fully alive. So I want to suggest that who God is commanding you and I to be is, in fact, who we at bottom want to be. And I want to try to prove that point by asking you three questions. These are rhetorical, so I don't need you to call anything out. But as I ask them, please do the hard work of reflecting on them internally. Do not answer as you think you ought to. Be brutally honest. Don't ask, what would Jesus have me say, or my wife, or mother, or something. Just, what do I actually think, even if it were to frighten you? Let's try it out. Three questions. The first, what kind of man do I want to be? Second, what kind of men do I respect? Dead or alive, fictional or not, doesn't really matter. What kind of men do I respect? And then finally, how do I want to be remembered when I'm dead? I think it's important to pause for a moment and remember the fact that you're going to die. And by the look of you, some of you sooner than later. And they'll put you in the ground, 
and they'll have a little ceremony where someone will lie about how great you were. And then the number one question people will be asking after your funeral is, where's the potato salad? There will come a time when somebody thinks about you for the last time. And those who will speak of you after you're in the ground won't speak of you any more than you speak about those who've gone before you. They'll say, oh yeah, God, yeah, God, God rest him. And that's it. If you died today in that seat, I'd still have a bourbon tonight. I wouldn't care that much. If I knew you, it might bother me. It would bother me. But this is the pitilessness of death, huh? The well will be over for you, and you're going to die. How do you want people to speak of you at your funeral if they weren't lying, if it wasn't a mock canonization process? These are good questions because I do think, unless you're a particularly vicious individual or are drunk, that you probably said something like I said. When I ask myself those questions, I say things like, I want to be good. I want to be a good dad. I don't want to be distracted with a thousand little projects and not look at my children. I want to love my wife even when I feel like I'm not getting a lot in return. I don't want to be, though I very often am, the sort of person who's very pleasant to be around when he gets essentially everything he wants. If I'm making love enough with my wife, if my kids are decently behaved, if the house is clean, I'm a very good person. But when I don't get what I want, they all cop my iciness, my passive aggressiveness, or my yelling and kicking things. I don't want to be like that. I want to be someone who is committed to what's true and is willing to take the virtuous road even if it isn't instant gratification. I want to be remembered like that. I want to be like that. I don't think anyone in this room thought to themselves, I want people to remember me as the guy who cheated on his wife uh, such that her and the kids never even knew. He was very stealth-like about the whole situation. And, uh, oh, Bob, gee, very hooked on porn. Uh, good though he was passionate about something. I don't think anybody thinks that. I, I think you think, I, don't, I just don't want, to, I don't want to do that. Maybe I am like that, but I don't bloody well want to be like that. When I was about 15, my best friend, one of my best friend's dad abandoned the family. He became very overweight. He moved to Bali, which is, I don't know, sort of like the equivalent of going somewhere to party, or whatever you do in the United States. And it was quite well known that he was buying whores and doing drugs and things like this. And he came back into town and he was just a fat dude with bleached blonde hair and nobody respected him. And I know that if I were to follow many of the impulses I have, that's me. But I see Jesus on the cross saying, come with me if you want to live, you know? And that's true of all of us. Those sins that you and I are particularly ashamed about, like very embarrassed, you're not bloody special. You know that, don't you? We're all in this thing together. If you think that you're particularly alone in your special little sin, it's only because you don't know how awful I am. One of the lovely things about growing in self-knowledge is whatever people might say about me negatively pales in comparison to what I already know about myself. I'm like, please, is that all you got? You have no idea. I think you and I are both far worse and far better than we think we are. But we want to be good. You know the story of Maximilian Kolbe, Franciscan priest during the Second World War, hit a couple of thousand Jews in his basement, taken to the Powiak, at, Powiak prison at Warsaw at one point, thrown into a cell with another man, and it's said that a Nazi guard walked past and saw this symbol of faith, you know, the Franciscan, looked like a Jedi, but with a rosary instead of the lightsaber. 
And he was outraged at the symbol of faith, and he held up the crucifix and said, Do you believe this? And Father Kolbe said, Absolutely, I do. And the guard punched him in the face, and he asked him the same question two more times. And each time, Father Kolbe said, Absolutely, I do. Whew. The man in the cell with him said, If it were not for the welts and blood arising on this man's face, you wouldn't know he was hit. And then I look at my life, and I'm tempted to grow in discouragement. Kolbe, of course, gave his life for a man in Auschwitz, Franciszek Gajewniczek. He was one of the men who was called to go down to the starvation bunker, and that's when Father Kolbe shuffled forward and said to the Nazi guard, I'd like to take his place. The guard said, who are you? And he said, I'm a Catholic priest. He said, why do you want to do a thing like that? And he gave the guard an answer he knew he'd accept. He said, well, I'm weak and useless. This man is strong and capable, and so he ushered them away. They said they were used to hearing cries of agony and people pleading for their life, and maybe there was some of that, but there was also hymns sung to the Blessed Mother. I don't know about you, but if I was a guard trying to punish people, that would really get under my skin, hearing you all being like, are they, are they? Shut up! We won't. He was preparing the men for their deaths. They said that when the men would, the guard would come in the morning to empty the urine bucket, it was empty. The men were drinking their own urine, scratching mud out of the walls, trying to satiate their hunger, and eventually they began to die. There was three men left, or thereabouts, Father Kolbe was one of them. They were eventually executed with a lethal injection, and when they came in, Father Kolbe wasn't kneeling in prayer or standing in prayer as he usually was, but slouched against the corner. And I don't know if this is apocryphal or not. I don't see why it would be, since he was a saint to the end. He raised his hand and said, Ave Maria, and then died. And then on The following day, the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, his body was incinerated. Franciszek Gajewniczek, whose life he spared, survived Auschwitz and went to the canonization process of Father Kolbe. And if you get a chance today, look up exactly what he had to say. He recounts that moment, and it's very, very potent. He says, who is this man, a stranger? Is he to give his life for me? What is this, some kind of dream? I could only thank him with my eyes. But you know, I I look at Father Kolbe, you know, doing what he did, and I see men do courageous things, and I wonder how it is you become like that. And I don't know. (laughs) It has something to do with the grace of God and our openness to it. But I have to think that it has to do at least with this, and that is, if I'm not faithful in the small things... How will, I ever be, how will I ever be faithful in the big things? If I'm not anticipating my wife's needs, not just doing something when she asked it for the third time and complaining about it, but if I'm not like seeking to love and to serve her, if I'm not doing the hard work of maybe going to therapy to deal with issues that are arising within me that I'd rather them not be there, if I'm not committed to my daily prayer, how will I ever be expect, how, why should I ever expect to be put in charge of these larger things? And when we read the writings of the saints, even quite modern saints like St. Francis de Sales and others who are writing to people in the world like us, they say that we should be spending at least an hour a day in prayer. And I look at my own life and very often fail to do this because of my cowardice. And I make excuses, but I know that they're lame. If you and I have time to watch Netflix or to listen to podcasts, we have enough time to spend time in mental prayer. And I I want to be better at that. Come, Lord Jesus, and give us the grace to be better at that. I went to World Youth Day in Canada in the year 2002. Pope John Paul II celebrated Holy Mass And one of the things he said that struck me was this. You are not the sum of your weaknesses and failures. 
you are the sum of the Father's love for you and your real capacity to be like His Son. Glory to Jesus Christ. I'd like to suggest five rules we can break to begin to be the sorts of men we respect and to be the sort of man God wants us to be. The first rule we need to break is the following. Never get into a fight. Now, the first fight I ever got into happened thusly. I had made the catastrophic shift from primary school to high school. And when I did that in my small country town of South Australia, I was aware of dozens of new students who had come from the public schools, you see. Their parents didn't want to have to pay for the, you know, grade one through to their senior year of Catholic schooling. It was far too much money. So they would send them to the public schools and then send them to the high schools. Makes sense. But see, we were all pretty sure that the public school kids smoked crack and worshipped Satan. <laughs> so I was a little nervous about arriving, you know. At primary school, I was like the big guy. And then I come into high school and I'm little and there's all these new people. Well, about two days in, I'm sitting in my home economics class, I think it was, and a kid by the name of uh, Mark, well, we won't say his last name because this might be, so his name is Mark, looked at me and he said, oi. I, actually, he was like 13, so he went, oi. <laughs> but it felt far more ominous to me at the time. Oi, I want to fight you. <laughs> I said, why? He said, because I don't like you. Fair enough. I looked at him, sized him up, I thought I could probably bloody take him. So, we decided to meet at a park up the road from my house shortly after school. Well, I was pumping myself up all day, and as I walked home, was picking up moderately sized sticks and breaking them over my iron quads and just pumping myself up. If I had the Karate Kid on video, I would have watched it. My friend Eric comes over on his BMX bike, and I get on mine, and we head off down to the park, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait. But he didn't show up. My friend Eric then suggests that we go to his house, because he knew where he lived, and I thought this was a cracker of an idea. <laughs> Never occurred to me how I would explain to his mother that I'm here to punch her beloved son in the face. But we rode our bikes to his house, and I remember standing on his front stoop and knocking on the metal door, and I was surprised to see Mark. He walked to the door, and he opened the door. He saw me, and then he ran. Now, you might be thinking, he ran back inside. No, he ran past me, which seemed weird. And so I was thinking, he's running away from me. This is, I didn't have time to process why he would be running outside, so I followed him to the lot next to his house. This lot was not another house, but a little park surrounded by trees. And as I approached the entrance to this park, I discovered that there were six or seven senior students and some of their girlfriends, and they were not on my team. And I became very afraid. You remember what it was like maybe getting into a fight in high school or maybe recently and just kind of getting that sick in the gut feeling like, oh, I'm dead. They said, we want to see a fight. And I said, oh, I said something pathetic like, oh, I'm not trying to start anything. I, I, I just came to, oh. I deserve to get my head punched in, honestly. They surrounded us and started pushing us into each other. Me and Mark, they were going to see a fight whether we wanted to or not. Well, one thing about me, you should know, is that I'm remarkably and, nay, disturbingly flexible. Uh, so at some point in the fight, I kicked my foot up like this. <laughs> and I think people just freaked out because they'd never seen a man kick so high. <laughs> I aimed it at Mark's head. I wasn't sure if I hit it or not, but the circle broke open. People were like, whoa! I was like, you're welcome. And I ran, ran away. That was the opening I needed. I got on my bike. I rode home. I was convinced they would have been following me. 
I kept looking over my shoulder. I finally got home, parked my bike in the shed, did my evening rituals with the parents and stuff and went to bed and uh, couldn't sleep. I thought, I've just run away from a fight on the second or third day of school. They are going to mock me until I leave it. Ah, I woke up and I tried so desperately to pretend I was sick. Hey, Mum. <coughs> oh, geez, you hear that? Super sick. Do you want me to stay home and watch television? You don't. Okay, good. So she sent me to school. And I arrived before everybody else. And I remember standing by my lockers, waiting for the abuse to begin. But it never came because a different story had begun to spread. As I was standing there, I saw a chap by the name of Glenn Gian Caspro, and he was walking towards me with, quite vigorously. He said, Fratty, that's what they called me, Fratty, is it true? What? <laughs> and then he said, I heard that you and Mark were getting into a fight and you kicked him in the face and were just like, I'm done here, and left. I said, yes. <laughs> you have heard correctly, sir. So I suppose I made contact and was something of a hero in my school for at least 48 hours. But we ought to fight for what we love and what's worth fighting for. Be that the people in our lives, our brothers, our time with our family, our spouses, now that I live in the United States, I have several firearms and I'm very enthusiastic about it. Thank you, America. <laughs> Wasn't sure how that was going to go over, so that's... <laughs> happy to live here. In 1 Peter 3.15, we read that we should always be ready to give a defense to anyone who calls us to account for the hope that's in us. In a sceptical, atheistic, godless nation such as this, I think we can say that now, can't we? Almost there. Yep, there we are. We ought to be able to give a defense for why it is we believe the things that we believe. Now, we don't all have to be walking encyclopedias like Jimmy Aiken, who, as Trent Horn once said, may be a cyborg sent from the future by God to save the church. But we should be able to give a basic defense as to why we believe in God and why we believe that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be and why we're Catholic. The second rule we should break is the following. Never think about sex. And now, forgive me, Jason, you may have said this, but Frank Sheed, who was an Australian apologist, once said that modern man practically never thinks about sex. He might dream about it and drool over it and joke about it and sing filthy songs about it, but he doesn't actually think about it because those activities are very different to thinking. What is sex? What's its purpose? Whose idea was it anyway? Right? Not Fifty Shades of Stupid, not uh, Kinsey or Hefner. It was God's idea. As Peter Kraft once pointed out, the first commandment in the Bible from God to humanity is to be fruitful and multiply, by which he did not mean grow bananas and invent calculators, multiply. <laughs> no, he meant have sex and have babies. So we know this. We know that sex is good. But we also know that it's, we live in a pornified culture and that our understanding of our own masculinity and femininity and the sexual act has been perverted in our minds. And for many of us, this causes us tremendous suffering. And you've already heard about some very good things that are available for you today. I want to tell you about one more. It's a 21-day detox from porn co course that I created called strive21.com. Now, if this isn't too awkward for you, I'd like to ask each of you to pull out your phones right now. If you don't have a phone, I respect that. But if you do have it, pull it out, because I'm willing to bet that either you find this to be tempting, or you know and love a brother who does find this a temptation. 
This 21-day porn detox course is 100% free and 100% anonymous. We've had over, I believe it's 48,000 men go through the course. We have had 2,500 men sign up this month already. These are men from all over the world. Again, they can use whatever name they want. It's free. So when you join this 21-day thing, you can be anonymous and you can go through it. It's basically like if you and I could have a coffee for 21 days and you were trying to overcome sexual impurity, what is it that I would say? And how would I build on what I've said the previous day? So it's very well produced and very nice. If you want to join it, text STRIVE to this number. So text STRIVE to 66866. And once you do that, you'll get a link and you can just go sign up and start. And you can be in communication with all these thousands of men from around the world who are currently going through this. So it's not an isolated activity. Strive to 66866. Can I say something else maybe a little more vulnerable? And that is, I think what happens with Catholic men, including myself, is we, we come to a point where someone explains to us why pornography and sexual acting out is a problem. We see the problem manifesting in our own life and can no longer deny that it is one. And so we make this sort of intellectual assent to the idea that pornography is degrading, emasculating, and things like this. And we hope that that intellectual recognition will get us through the sort of rest of our life so that we won't fall back into it. For me, in my own life, what I'm discovering is I need to bring my own history, my own woundedness into the discussion with our Lord and even in therapy to find healing in these deep places. I'm currently doing this weekly with somebody, a therapist, and am finding a new degree of, of healing that I didn't think was possible. And it's bloody hard. And it's really scary, um, but I think it's worth it. So if you are in this and would like not to be, I think we have to make some manful, bloody decisions to get out. I was speaking at a Sikh conference a few years back, and a young man came up to my booth, and he said, oh, hi, I've read that book of yours on pornography and stuff. Cool. He said, I've uh, been trying really hard to be free. It's just so hard, you know? I said, yeah. I agree, it's God, it's very tempting. I'm still tempted, I get it. He's like, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, did you, you know, did you get covenant eyes? Nah, I got it, but I don't know, I just couldn't really, didn't really, couldn't afford it. All right, it's not that much, but it's fine. What about an accountability partner? Do you have an accountability partner, somebody who knows what's going on in your life? Nah, there's no one in my, like, area, really. And at some point, I just went Jose Maria Escriva on him. I said, well, I don't know, if I shouldn't pin this on Escriva. I, I went Matt Fratt on him. What I said was, I said, okay, well, why don't you just go upstairs and, like, jerk off to porn? Because it's that free internet, so you could just go do that now. You don't have to come to the next thing. You probably have time, right? Are you in, like, a room on your own? He looked up at me with some horror and said, well, I, I don't want to do that. And I said, well, start acting like a bloody man about it. Stop pussyfooting around with sin. Stop making excuses for your cowardice and make a bloody decision to be better. Because I think what happens is part of us makes a decision to be better, and then another part of us doesn't want to let go of those immoral Netflix shows that we keep watching, those filthy conversations we continue to engage in, those sexualized songs we keep listening to, and we just stay weak. Um, now, just if he had have walked away, I would have grabbed him by the shoulder and slapped him. But I, like, I think it's, it's important to realize that you and I can ruin our life if we'd like to. We can absolutely remain stuck in this for the rest of our lives. We'll see how bland reality becomes and how wide the gates of hell are. But it is an option for us. But I don't want to bloody do that. Like, even if the church came out tomorrow and said, hey, I've done some extra thinking on this and we've decided porn's okay. And even if all the top theologians could convince me that it was, I still wouldn't want to. It's not, like I, it's not like I want to not look at porn because the church says don't. It's like I just, I, I don't want to be the kind of person who, yeah, masturbates to women pretending to like him. I don't want to do it. I don't, you know, I, I want to take the narrow road. I don't want to take this broad, bloody path. Anyway, hopefully you do too. Number three. 
And we should say this, right? Suppose last night you fornicated. Suppose you've been in like a sodomite relationship. Suppose you saw a prostitute last week. Suppose you masturbated this morning, right? No matter where you are, right? It's, it's really important to realize, and you know this, but I need to remind all of us of it again, that all of your sin compared to God's mercy is like, as Therese of Lisieux once said, a drop of water being flipped into a raging furnace. Your sins are the least interesting thing about you. If you've been involved in serious sin, be it sexual or otherwise, run to confession. Grab hold of the priest's arm and don't allow him to leave until he hears your confession. My children don't care if they wake me up at three in the morning. Well, you can say to him, you're my spiritual dad, so sit down. (laughs) Go to war on your ego in the confessional. Don't begin with, well, like it's tough right now, because shut up. Just brutalize your cowardice and receive the mercy of God. And some of you might be in here and it's been years since you've gone. As a fellow sinner and someone who is just right there with you, I encourage you to do what I want to do. Run to the sacrament of confession. I think it was St. John Vianney who said, God desires to save a sinner from his sin more than a mother desires to save her baby from a burning building. He desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So get to confession because you don't have to be saved. Hell is a real possibility for you and I. Number three, never risk it all. When I was 17 years old, I was agnostic or atheist, depending on my digestion, and went to a well youth day in Rome in the year 2000. I was 17 years old. Some of you were fetuses. That's okay. And during that time, I encountered the Lord Jesus Christ and came back like one of those insufferably happy Christians. I would bring my Bible to the parties I used to drink at because I thought, maybe we could read a bit of chapter 5 from Matthew's gospel. I was so on fire for the Lord. Looking back, it felt like I developed another sense akin to sight. And I just saw, quote unquote, something that I had never seen before and was desperate to share it with everybody. Lost a lot of friends that way. But one thing people would sometimes say to me is, don't go overboard, right? Just it's people like my beautiful father would say, it's nice that you've found religion. Like, yeah, that's what's bloody happened. I've found... Re- no, I've come to believe that God exists. And he's got a plan for my life and he loves me. And he loves me too much to leave me that way. And by his death and resurrection, he's opened heaven under my feet. If that's not something to get excited about, nothing is. Incidentally, the same people that would tell me not to risk it all and not to go overboard were the same sorts of people who would paint their faces and scream at sports games, which I've never understood, but good for you if you're into that kind of thing. We need to risk everything for Jesus Christ. Some of you might be currently dating a young woman, and uh, you know you should propose because she's better than you anyway. So propose before she figures that out, right? (laughs) Now, my wife married up, so I don't know, I can't relate to you. (laughs) But she's definitely better than you, and so you should propose and stop being a wimp. Uh, uh, Father Bob Bedard once said, since discernment became fashionable, no one's made a decision since. (laughs) We should discern. But then we shouldn't hide behind that pious-sounding activity to hide our cowardice. Some of you are being called to the priesthood, perhaps. Do it. Discern. Then hurry up. The church needs you now. Or I look at my own marriage, and I see the ways that I am just selfish with my wife. One of the things my wife's been going through a lot lately is just this sickness. Like, my wife's just in chronic pain constantly. It's really hard. I have all these lies in my head about it shouldn't be this way. Like, if I had married someone else, like, it wouldn't have been this way. And I'm not ashamed to admit those things, because I know you all are idiot sinners like I am. So, we're all in this together. But I'm bringing this to the Lord, and I've got good men around me who, if I ever were to abandon my wife, would beat the crap out of me. 
That's the kind of person you want in your life. Someone who will physically assault you. I want to risk everything for my marriage. I want to be someone who loves my wife even when I feel like, you know, I'm not, I'm not being cherished or loved or seen the way I think I ought to be. I want to be. I want to be that kind of bloke, you know. Number four, never give in to peer pressure. This is good advice if your peers are idiots. But why are you hanging out with idiots? Now, to be fair, we're all idiots in some sense. But I want you and I want me to hang out with good men who love Jesus Christ and want nothing but sanctity. And I don't want to spend time with people who erode my faith. Now, there's no excuse for you not to proceed in this manner since you're surrounded by men who presumably thought it worth their time to come to a conference like this to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. I've never really believed that any one of us could have a number of friends, a number of close acquaintances, but I do think, well, maybe you disagree, but I, I, I think like a solid three, two or three men who you can bear your soul to, you know, who you can walk the walk with. And maybe today, this is the day where you join a men's group and stop trying to walk this alone. And as you walk it with these brothers, my hope is that you and I will give in to peer pressure and go to adoration and pick up the rosary daily and start to date our wives or start to make choices to stop engaging in immoral media or something like that. We give in to that peer pressure to be a saint. Fifthly and finally... Never ask directions. <laughs> they tell me that men are supposed to be quite good with directions. I never got that gift. It's to the point now, if I come to a, an intersection and I can go left or right, I basically just go against whatever my inclination is. It's pretty bad. Um, but we need to humble ourselves. It's so bloody hard. Oh, 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 it's so hard to humble ourselves. Because I think for many of us, myself included, you kind of grow up, you're afraid that if people saw you for who you are, they wouldn't accept you. And so you put on this front, whether that be funny or macho or intelligence or something. And this is the thing you show to everybody. And being humble often means sort of laying that down and just sort of being vulnerable. And I think this is the very thing that our adversary, the devil, does not want us to do. But I think real brotherhood is being able to, in a sense, say to your friend, if you want to hurt me, here's, here's how you do it. I think that's real brotherhood, you know? When we know each other's deep places and secrets and loves. But some of you might have to ask directions in the sense of counseling, Therapy, spiritual direction, confession. So we'll close on that note again, and I know I've already stressed this, but I want to say it one more time. I would beg you as a brother in Christ to go to the sacrament of confession. If there was one doctrine in Christianity that I could change, it would be eternal conscious torment in hell. I don't like that. I wish it weren't true. I'd like to see a, a, a way out of it. But I would like also, hopefully more than that, to be a humble son of the church. And when the scriptures testify to this real possibility for us, and the saints testify to it, almost unanimously, when the catechism of the Catholic Church states it, when our blessed Lord himself makes it pretty clear, then I have to say to myself, well, this is the way things are. And I don't want to spend eternity in hell, and that is a real possibility for me. So, I trust in the Lord's great mercy and grace, and I need to start taking this Christian walk far more seriously than I've taken it. And the spiritual authors talk about these different uh, growths in sanctity. We begin with a sort of mercenary love of our Lord, where we do things out of fear, and that's maybe where some of us are. Uh, but as we grow, it tends to be more of a loving relationship where it's not so much out of fear but of love. And that's, of course, the goal. But there might be some of you in here today 
who are in serious sin, are not going to holy mass, are engaged in things that you shouldn't be engaged in, and maybe you need a slap in the face. So there's my slap in the face to you. Uh, Don't do that. Repent. Uh, Come to Jesus. Uh, It's pretty simple, isn't it? Stop sinning. Stop it. (laughs) You done? That's good. And when you do, get up and keep moving forward like I'm trying to. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father God, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that by the death and resurrection of your Son, you have opened heaven under our feet. I thank you that you are infinite in mercy, and that our sins, no matter how grave or many they are, are only finite. We thank you that you've opened heaven under our feet. We're sorry that we act too often as orphans instead of sons. By your grace, give us the courage we need to live a heroic Christian life and the courage we need to purge out of our lives those behaviors and even relationships that are making us less than we ought to be. Blessed Mother, pray for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. All right, thanks for putting up with me.